for dry eyes. So it's a significant problem. And as baby boomers are happening, there's going to be more dry eyes. But it turns out, actually, that I, we're now seeing teenagers and people in their 20s and 30s with dry eyes because everyone's playing, they're all these kids are playing these games all day long and they're staring and not blinking. Their eyes are drying out and it starts this whole cascade of problems that leads to dry eyes, which we're going to show you about. Uh, so um, we'll start. So there's a whole mixture of dry eyes. Dry eyes is just not one problem. It's just not, it's, it's one disease that encompasses many etiologies. So it's not just straightforward that I don't have enough water in my eye. That's, that's not it. So there's two basic forms of dry eyes. That is, that is the tear film. And so we're going to go over. There's three layers to your tear film. There's a mucus layer, a water or liquid layer, and an oily layer. So the aqueous tear deficiency, and these numbers are probably a little bit high, uh, that 40%. But that is, these, this type of dry eye is due to you not producing enough of the liquid part of your tear. And, but that's probably maybe, in my experience, maybe 25%. Evaporative tear deficiency is probably 75% of dry eye problems. And there's a little mixture between the two. You've got a little bit of both. And so dry eyes is just from aqueous decreased production. It can be aging or hormonal. You could be different things. You've lost nerve, nerve supply to your eye or something happened. But the major cause that we're going to discuss of dry eyes is meibomian gland dysfunction or disease. Mm -hmm. And that is by far the most common cause of dry eyes. So also that common happens along with it is a lot of people have a blepharitis along with their dry eyes. And why, does that, why is that related? So blepharitis means inflammation of your lid. So the Latin word for lid is bleph. So blepharitis is an inflammation or infection to your eyelids, and especially right where the lashes are. And the old term for this was called, as a kid, called granulated eyelids. That was an old common term that people used. And so you can have just the anterior portion of the lid infected where the lashes are. And this can be related to a staph bacteria very commonly that hangs around. And or a seborrheic skin condition. Or it could be rosacea. And so those things can cause this anterior. The more posterior are meibomian gland disease. This, these little spots are where the glands are like little pustules, and right here's where the openings are to your meibomian glands. So this is a deeper level of inflammation or infection. And this is what your tear film looks like. So I told you that it's more than just water. There's a whole bunch of stuff in your tear film. Uh, I mean, there are just your normal electrolytes. So when you get a blood test, and your potassium level, your salt level, your chloride level, all that's measured in your body. Your body has to maintain a certain amount of electrolytes or you and I wouldn't be talking if it wasn't in a normal range. And if you, if you take a lot of salt in, then your salt levels aren't going to be high because your body is going to retain water to balance that out. And so your body is going to always maintain a certain level. Years ago, there's a little protein called lactoferrin and I had a machine years ago that would measure that. But that was a lab test with a little liquid reagent. And the company who made it just had troubles keeping them consistent so our, our test results were accurate. But eventually that probably will come back someday. So if your light to fairing levels were low in your, then we knew your tear film was low. Also, you have the bottom mucin layer, and then you have the water layer, and then sitting on top is this oily layer. And all these different electrolytes, chemicals, IgE, different kinds, all these, all these things are located in your tear. So it's just very complex. So how do we d diagnose dry eyes? One way is we put the little yellow dye that you get when you get your uh, pressure check. We put that in your eye, and then we count the wind that starts breaking apart that it's not a smooth tear film of that dye. And so that's going to break up time. 
And so we tell people, don't blink and then count the seconds. How many seconds does it count before this starts falling apart? And a normal person is about eight or nine seconds before things start to separate. Your eyes can be red and injected, and we have different stains that we can put on the eye, and it stains, and these are actually dead cells. So your eye dries up so much to the point that the cells on your eye actually degenerate. Your, your, the, there's not your, your eye is a mucous membrane, just like your stomach or your mouth, and if you don't have enough moisture there, those cells will die. So it's different stainings. This is staining from fluorescein, rose being all different ones. And then also, we, how often should you blink? Blinking is extremely important. So you should, an average person blinks about 15 times a minute. That's a lot of blinking. Someone has Parkinson's disease, which you can tell when I see someone has Parkinson's, I tell right away because they don't blink. And they have horrible dry eye growth. Another test that we use for this, probably been around for 40 or 50 years, is a Schirmer's test. So this little strip of paper is put in the eye and is left there for five minutes, and then we measure how many millimeters of that paper did your tears wet. And I don't use it very much because it's, compared to what we have today, it's, it's, not, it's just not as useful because we can get more specific than that. And then there's now a tear osmolarity. This is a different machine uh, that's in a lab, but we now have a tear osmolarity machine, and that's part of my workup. So when you come in for dry eyes, we measure, take a sample of your tear, and then it measures how salty your tear level, it, tear film is. So I've already told you that your body has to have a normal salt level or you're not walking around, <coughs> but your eye is exposed to the environment. And so if the tears evaporate off your eye, the salt can't, or minerals, all those things in your tear, gets left behind. So therefore, you're the, the, what's left behind is more hypertonic or more salty, more concentrated. So we can measure exactly how salty your tears are, which tells me how much liquid do you have in your eye. So we can, now it's not a guess, we get specific numbers. We also have a little gadget that we use that we come in and gently put some mild amount of pressure and we then press on these glands to see if what kind of liquid is coming out of glands. Is anything coming out? If it is coming out, is it clear? Is it cloudy? Or is it coming out like cheese? So you can see here, if you press on it, there's a little, slight little liquid bump where it's coming out of these glands. So that's a normal meibomian gland. And this is what the glands look like inside your lid. So they're they come up and they secrete to the, out that little opening. They're working on getting another instrument, who knows what that's going to cause, that actually we will be able to examine how healthy those glands look with an instrument of some sort. But they're working on that now. So when we look at your lids now, we're looking to see how this, this is normal looking. This, is, this gland's totally plugged. Not, there's not, nothing coming out of that. You can see increased blood vessels. So all this is inflamed, these glands are, the organs are inflamed, and the stuff coming out of this is thick. So that's not normal. So if that's, if that's what your myeloma gland is producing, you're going to have pretty bad rise. It's more subtle things. We can actually express what comes out, uh, but we'll skip over that. This is, this is a more magnified view. And you can see all this dryness. There's no, and your tear film is all foamy looking. And all these little dry spots are dead cells. So people can get severe dry eyes. This would blur your vision. So people commonly who have dry eyes complain of blur, or intermittent blurred vision. Because your eyes aren't the same amount of dry. How well you're blinking, what you're doing, if you're reading, not reading outdoors. So people who complain with, with dry eyes complain a lot that intermittently my eyes blur. Or after I read for 10 or 15 minutes or longer, then they blur. Because when you read, you don't blink as much, then your eye dries out faster. So this tear breakup can, just different ways, it can just fall apart, or you get these sort of breakup that are streaks where the tear film breaks apart. And like I said, this is normal, seven or eight, nine seconds. And so, and this is more staining. So all these are dead cells on the surface of somebody's cornea. The same thing here. This is a breakup time that shows you that the tear film is just not very good. So what happens? 
In a north normal tier, you have an oily layer at the top, all those things that we showed you in your tear film, and then this mucus layer in the bottom. What happens is, is this, is this lipid layer becomes worse, then you don't have enough protection here, so then your tears start to evaporate out, and they get severe enough, then it goes all the way down, and this is where you start getting dead cells, because there's nothing covering over those cells to protect it. So what happens, like we're talking about hyperosmolarity, so now all this stuff is now more concentrated. And this is what happens. So as your salt level goes up, the salt causes an inflammatory reaction on the cells of the surface of your eye. That inflammation then damages those cells, so now they don't work as well, and then it gets worse. And done. So it's a gradual increase in how bad your dry gets over a year. It's not quickly, it's over years of time. So now there's a big panel to put together and how we categorize from mild to moderate and the different treatments this organization uh, has come up with. We follow some of this, but I sort of come up with my own system that's similar to that. So in most cases, 75% of the time, we're going to have to get this lipid layer to be better so now your whole tear film is stable. Because if the lipid layer falls apart, then everything underneath it falls apart. So one way to try to get this to work a little better, and then we'll go over that a little bit later how we treat things, is hot compresses and lid hygiene. So if you have chronic blepharitis or chronic meibomianitis, <clears throat> then we put people on hot compresses. <clears throat> so we have a, a set of goggles here that we can use for people, or you can take a washcloth, put it in hot water. Hot as you can stand in it without burning yourself. You hold it up, when it cools down, back in the water, back up for 10 or 15 minutes. So you've got to really work at it pretty good. Um, the, um, and some people do it twice a day, but it's at least first thing in the morning. The driest moment that they've measured, so the driest time for your eyes is one second before you wake up in the morning. That's your driest moment. Now, you have other times where it's dry, but they've measured it, and that's typically the driest time. So this is what your lid looks like. So the thing about the hot compresses is, is it's on the outside. It's got to go through the skin, the muscles, all this tissue to get to the gland in the back of the lid. So hot compresses help, but it's a little bit limited because you have to go through all this tissue to get the heat deeper in. That's the reason why it needs to take 10 or 15 minutes to work. So we also offer nutritional supplements, which we're going to go over as well. So uh, there's a lot of studies, older studies, that said omega-3 or fish oil, high doses of it, improved your tear function. And that's probably true, but we have things that are better than that now, which we'll go over. This is an antibiotic. For, so if you have this staph bacteria around your eyelashes and this inflammation in your lid, then we put people on this, and another type of antibody, but this one works really well. It, it kills the staph bacteria, and it helps, it actually has some help of actually making the, the oily layer a little better. And it's only once at bedtime, so it's easy to use. And it also, which the drug company can't put in their label because they haven't proved it, they haven't gone back and done a study for the FDA, but it actually has significant anti-inflammatory properties. So it all actually calms the eye down and cuts down on the inflammation, which is great. So we use this especially after, we, which we go over the treatment, when we do the lipid flow treatment, we use this. There's a, a, there are glasses that have this foam around that seals your eyes. So people have severe dry eyes. I have people come to my office who put tears in their eyes every 10 minutes, seven days a week. And so, they're protect, so to protect their eyes from the environment, then it has this foam, so it seals around their eyes so there's no air getting in and drying their eye out. Because if you lived in Arizona, you would be a lot worse than by living here. Because the environment has a significant factor on how dry your eyes are. If you go into Walmart to go look for something, they run the air conditioner at that place, high, full bore, 24 hours a day, and the air in there is extremely dry. And then you're staring to look at something, 
and not blinking. So then 